Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, thanks to some scheduling gymnastics tricks by the team, uh, we have made a little bit more time. Uh, so Yost and I are going to have a conversation together about what's going on in education right now. And then, um, of course, if you have any questions about uh, education, either you know higher education, adult education, kids, whatever, start putting them in, ask a question, and we will get to as many of those as possible in our session today. Um, I'll do a quick uh, reintro of Yos. So she is the co-founder and CEO of an ed tech startup called Bnova, B-E-E-N-O-V-A, A-I. She works closely with a global team and believes education has the power to change our world. She's passionate about building things that make the lives of others better. Thanks again for joining us, maybe for the third time today, but we appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it too. I'm so excited because, you know, originally we had time for a presentation and some Q&A, but I think between you and me, we're going to just have a nice discussion around education. So definitely looking forward to any questions from this amazing global audience that we have today as well. So I think we should have a nice interactive experience. Sounds great. Well, let's let's start with maybe a, a bigger question. And what what is your take on the current state of education globally? Well, I like that we're diving right in, Adam. That's a great question. Um, so obviously with regards to education globally, and I think this is just something that COVID-19 has done really well. It's told us that there's a crisis in education, but this virus or spending time thinking about the virus didn't cause that crisis. We've been having a global education crisis on our hands for a very long time from outdated curricula, um, class sizes that don't suit the, the learner needs, to not teaching 21st century skills, to not using the right technologies, a lack of safe spaces. There's so many issues in education. And this period of time actually gives us a really good opportunity to rethink what are we actually teaching? Why are we teaching this? And how can we teach skills for the future so that we can build a global mindset for more conscious living? And when we start to think about education and traditional systems that have sustained us for quite a while, let's actually consider this a conversation where we can say, okay, well, what is it that we want to see moving forward? So in a nutshell, education's been in a crisis situation for a long time. And the pandemic that the world is currently facing is just bringing that to the forefront. For sure. I want to I want to zoom in on one of the things that you mentioned about skills for the future. Can you talk a little bit about what you think some of those key skills are for students and probably even adults to have at, uh, moving forward? Yeah sure. yeah, yeah, sure. That's a great, such a great point. I'm so glad that you immediately wanted to talk about that because future skills are, when we think about them, we think, okay, critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, skills that we need to really have to turn up to do the jobs of tomorrow and to differentiate us from the machines that we're building. So it's actually a really interesting dichotomy, a really interesting skill set that we have to have, not just to show up as our best human selves, but actually to perform in the new labor market, to turn up as 360 degree humans that solve problems like COVID-19 together and to build innovative solutions that can actually tackle things like the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So when we talk about future skills, we talk about those critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and also a, a skills framework that is actually a seven piece themed framework that looks at things like the ability to self-learn, the ability to care about the environment, the way that we interact with our government or others around us. So there's actually a very comprehensive framework that is designed to categorize and analyze these types of skills that can help us prepare for our future better. Yes. Uh, it, it's fun when those same skills continue to pop up no matter what conversation you're having. So it's what's clear to me is that we've identified those, I think there was four or five-ish um, that you put in there that we need to continue to, to reinforce. And really we can start doing from from a very young age and all the way through adulthood. I mean, I feel like I could, could never learn to be as creative as, as possible. Um, sure. let's, let's talk about some of the obvious things that are on people's mind here, especially around, uh, schools closing. So many parents are not only finding themselves working at home for the first time, but they're working at home with their kids and trying to figure out, are, am I going to be homeschooling for the foreseeable future? So, um, what's, what's going on with schools? Okay. So that's a great point. So 
millions, obviously, millions of students are not going to school right now. And not only does that bring up these questions of, okay, how am I cohabiting with my parents? How am I cohabiting with my pets? Um, you know, this is like, an, an the thing about school is that for many kids, it's, you know, we see it across the US, it's actually a place where they get fed or where a meal is delivered or where there's a safe space. So removing that safe space psychologically is a big issue for, for kids and it's a, or it's, a, it's a big problem. So from a working from home perspective, we have to be really mindful that it's not just the lack of education, but it's also the lack of a safe space that could potentially be causing a lot of issues for kids around the world. And the second thing is that cohabiting, because obviously a lot of us are working from home now as well. And OK, beyond the everyday, like, how do I do my schedule? You know, I, I don't see my colleagues in person anymore. It, I feel kind of lonely. These are all very normal things to experience. But on a bigger scale, we attach so much value to our school system and to our work system that for a lot of people, this brings into questions of value. What is my value? If I'm not working, what am I doing? If I'm not going to school, who am I? So we, unbeknownst to us, attached so much identity to systems that are actually really antiquated. School, the way it is working right now, is outdated. Many parts of our workforce, many ways in which some traditional systems at work are working, are also ways for us to identify with something that might not actually be our true selves. So I would say that this is a really great opportunity, a great moment in time for us to think about, okay, well, if we have this opportunity now to not be constantly um, in, a, in a pattern or in a habit that's dictating our life, how can we stop and really think about what it is that we want to learn and what it is that we want to teach? Can you talk a little bit about what some of the more interesting, uh, I'll call it innovations or creativity that you've seen people take on um, since COVID-19 has really uh, hit and forced people to go go home? What's, what are some of the cool and interesting things you've come across people trying? Yeah, this is a great question. I think that, um, you know, I love seeing some of my actor friends on Instagram. They're like, gosh, I've been doing these home, you know, videos and like working from home for like the last 10 years. So you have this one side of people that's like, yeah, this is this is just the way of my life. And then this other group of people that are like, well, I'm very used to the nine to five or I'm very used to go going into a place. And from a a schooling perspective, it feels to me like many schools are really trying to say, okay, what are the most creative things that we can do? And I actually, in the slides that you know we'll go over later and we can share later, there's a really great um, daily schedule that has like an hour and a half of walking outside, 30 minutes of no screen time doing math or reading or you know something in a traditional way, then 30 minutes of playing. And you know, you see these ways of restructuring a learning day where you're actually making learning moments count throughout the day, as opposed to saying, okay, this is a really like tight schedule that you need to stick to in order to learn traditional subjects that are actually outdated. Um, I saw this great example of kids that are recording their PE sessions. So obviously they, they can't go to physical education because they're not going to school. And, but they still have to do like an hour of exercise a day. And this one parent said that their kid had gone to PE and you know participated, but then spent an hour and a half actually editing the video instead of you know doing the class. So you know you just see people navigate and and go to what they genuinely are inclined to do, and that's something we should celebrate and bring to the forefront when we think about redesigning education. That's a, I'll pull this question that's in the chat, um, but every, everybody moving forward, put your questions in the ask a question feature. But this one was just such a perfect uh, segue to what uh, Joseph was just saying. So he says, as a world traveler, uh, where have you observed educational systems that engage a child's full potential in all artistic, intellectual, and uh, I'll put it physical facets? Brian, you make me feel like I should tell you I've traveled to another planet. Um, no, I think it's a great question. And, and, you know, I have had the opportunity to see the inside of many different classrooms. I grew up in 12 countries and I've been to roughly 99. But I think what actually is the most amazing about it is that every classroom had its own beauty and its own aspects that we could actually look at combining. So classrooms across the African continent that I've seen and that I've been in and taught in had amazing real life just learning about just just real they were real and when i look at some of the schools in the us or in europe there's amazing techno technological advances um there's art there's music so i think where we can actually strike a really great balance is by saying okay the system that we designed 
you know, in the 17, 1800s that still largely guides the way that we teach today. Let's pull elements from all different school models. And there are some amazing schools in North America that are actually just completely open classrooms. So completely open. Um, let's take all those amazing elements and try and build that into a sustainable education system. Now, we know that that's not always feasible. You know, cities like New York are high, dense, dense cities where kids, like I said, have to go to school just as sometimes a way to get a meal, right? So we have to take all those societal challenges and into account. But what we can do is we can think about using sustainable and scalable ways to make as much art, as much creativity, as much critical thinking as possible available to students around the world. And I do believe that technology allows us to do that. And um, we can we can do those solutions. They're definitely there. That's at our fingertips. And now is the, the moment to seize that as well. What are some of those scalable and sustainable uh, ways that you've seen work well so far? I think, oh, that's, again, an awesome question. And I, I, the first way I'd want to answer it is that from a country perspective, each country has their own system. Um, each continent has its own system that really works. So where there's lower connectivity, um, you might want to think about, you know, using a cell phone or something, something a little more light. Um, so first of all, let's be really adaptive and really listen to the audience that we're trying to serve, because then we can use technology to build sustainable solutions. Because if we're working in like a really siloed city and trying to build something for the world, that's kind of difficult. Um, so some of the solutions that I love are, for example, this innovative model of building daycare centers across um, neighborhoods by allowing people to have a small like early childhood development center in their own house that takes the pressure off of working parents. Um, but if we, you know, that obviously works in a non-corona era when we can be together in the same place. But if we think about it digitally, there's so much we, we're doing actually with AI, um, really building personalized learner profiles that don't just understand content, but that understand the person that's learning. You know, what is their mood? Um, how conscious are they? What's their mindset like? Um, and that's something that I think has become so prevalent now because we see the world is reacting to this this pandemic and we're either reacting with fear or we're reacting with love. There are no other options. So if we could react from a place of love, then we can start to build an education system that supports that. And for me, that that really lies in personalization. So if we can personalize a learning experience by using sustainable and scalable technology like AI, we can absolutely make sure that arts, creativity, um, even, even math and science, even traditional subjects are available to learners around the world, and that's kids and adults. What do you see as some of the biggest barriers to adopting uh, the model that you're you're referencing? Like, how do we how do we go from here to um, these more scalable, accessible, and um, generalizable is the wrong word, but kind of widespread systems? I think that's yeah. Like, we all have our own reasons to resist change. Change is scary, and Change doesn't have, you know, all we know with change is that it's going to be different. But something like what's happening right now, in a weird way, the world has, we have to adapt, we have to make a change. And we can do that by having a great, expansive, positive mindset. For sure, I believe in that. So when I think we resist change, it's because we, we tend to fear the unknown. And that's understandable because the unknown can be scary and we don't know what to expect. So um, I believe that changing education isn't about making it so that, you know, we, we end up with all these unexpected scenarios, but it's about saying, okay, if we know that certain things work, like we know that mindset is important. We know that emotional intelligence is important. We know that conscientiousness is important in a world where we've got the UN sustainable development goals that we're trying to solve. How can we build all that into a future model of education in order to make sure that we reach some of these really big global education challenges? I think people might be hesitant to adopt that sometimes because, like I said, if it's not something you know or if it's not something that you feel you know enough about, it might be hard to, to take it on board. And some of the ways to mitigate that and to make it easier is by supplementing learning. So not doing everything on technology, but saying, okay, we're going to 
you know, share this question via a technological platform. So you either do it on your phone or your laptop or whatever it is, but you have to go and engage with your classmates and then come back to the tool because we know we want that outside engagement as well. We don't want to lose that. So if we can start striking really good balances in that space, then I think we we can definitely build solutions for the crisis that we're currently facing. I love the um, combining the digital tools with actual physical experiences just as a way to, to connect those two things together. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how our brains more commonly than not want to think about things as like very fixed and finite. It's like, oh, well, if I'm doing this thing, I only do it digitally. Um, whereas like in the ideal world, we'd be running these virtual summits you'd be with a group of people around you. And so you're consuming content, you know, coming from a platform, but then you're out having discussions or really interacting and wrestling with it with other folks. Um, all right, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and go to a Q and a from the audience. Sure. So the first question comes in from V. Thank you, V. Um, how do we make sure that we align formal education with industry needs in the best possible way? And I think that it's a great question coming from where we just were with Peter talking about automation and robots. Uh, how do we how do we align those two? Thank you so much for your question, V. Um, that's so nice. Thank you for participating this evening or this morning or afternoon. Not sure where you are. Um, so we don't know many of the jobs that the jobs you know, even that I think is tricky because we do look at, you know, all having different skill sets and how do we make the most of those different skill sets at different times, right? So it's hard to put things in the same boxes as we always have. Now, to think that we're going to wake up tomorrow and everything's going to be automated, that's also not necessarily the, you know, the right way to swing things. But we try and find a happy medium. Then there are, of course, there are technologies that we can use to help us understand where our skill gaps lie. So what kind of skills we need more of. And you know, an interesting place for you to start V might be the LinkedIn report that was released on March 3rd that really talks about some of the skills that corporates, uh, corporate employees, for example, would like to have more access to. And those are actually a lot of soft skills. But of course, we also have technical skills that many of us feel are really important to learn. Um, but I would say, V, and this is just my opinion and my background, of course, and my experience, but one way to think about the skills that we want to learn for the future is to think about how do we differentiate ourselves from the machines that we're building? So what are we better at right now? And what will we probably always be somewhat better at? Now, that's, of course, a bold statement because we never know. And the future changes. Things change all the time. We, we, know, we can't predict the future. So I would say right now, think about the skills that you can develop to work with the machines and to stay as human as possible, because that's what we need. Conscientious, conscious humans doing their best work on Earth. Yes. And... To take us um, to keep keep going on that a little bit, but talk about a different kind of sense of connection. Uh, Vincenzo is asking, what would be some good ways to bridge education with the physical presence of nature? Oh, Vincenzo, I love this question so much. I'm actually you can't see it now because my curtains are closed, unfortunately. But I'm in this like nature park right now, and it's been superb because there's like birds chirping. Um, yeah, so many of us miss this when actually just even 15 to 20 minutes of walking in nature can can really revive your spirit. You know, we want to connect with nature. So something that we've done um, and built into Binova um, is, and I'm only giving you this example because it's quite specific to something that we also really take into account is we have exercises that actually encourage you to be outside. So the first thing we do is we look at conscientiousness, like how are you feeling today? And if you were to say, you know, Vincenzo, if you said, gosh, you know, I'm a little bit anxious, one of our follow up learnings for you might be to take a 15 to 20 minute walk outside so that you can actually reconnect with nature because we know that that's important. So especially when we're living in such a saturated world with so much data coming at us, we want to help remind you that taking 15 to 20 minutes for a breath of fresh air can actually hugely help you. So that's one way that we've built it into learning. We know not everybody has the luxury to be out in nature all day, every day. Um, as much as we might all want to be. Amen to that. Uh, every day after we get we get done this virtual session, I go out and spend a solid 30 minutes or so just walking around my neighborhood. Unfortunately, there's nobody out there, so it's just me, but it's uh, it's nice to go get some fresh air. All okay. right, I think we got, we got time for a couple more. Um, 
Are there, I'm not sure if you can pull these up, but maybe you can grab one that, that interests you, Yos. I saw, let's see. There are all so many great question, um, questions. Okay, so I think perhaps here, the question from Mikola about, what do you think about using digital tools, especially AI for personalized tracking down the results of education? Adam, do you see that question as well? Uh, I don't, but go, go run with it. <laughs> okay, cool. So um, I think, I hope that the, your name is pronounced Mikola, 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 but in any case, thank you for asking your question. And I think, look, there's so many ways in which we can use technology. And the technology we build is often kind of a reflection of, you know, the the mindset and the personality and maybe some of the energy that we want to put into our tools, right? So for the team that I work with, for us, human-based technology is our driver. Like we want to make technology that works with people, that works for people, and that has a human base as its as its main element. So your question, you know, I think there's two ways to look at it. Is the AI controlling? Is the AI controlling and tracking? Or is it measuring and supporting? And I would always want to lean towards measuring and supporting. That's just who I am. Um, and I know that there's also ways to use it to control and to, you know, from a fear-based perspective. But if we look at creating technology from an expansive perspective that looks at supporting, um, at understanding, then we can actually really allow tools like AI to help us and to personalize education and to make it sustainable and scalable so that more people have access to quality education that they deserve. Yes. Try to pick out one more for us at least. I think you've you've gotten through a couple of these before I even bothered to open them up. Um, oh, here's a good one about personalized learning um, that comes from Bouquet. And like Yo said, if we butcher your names or mispronounce them, we apologize. Um, learning happens best when instruction is personalized to meet the needs and strengths of each child, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, how do you view the current state of adaptive technology? Um, in terms of being able to increase learning outcomes, um, especially with students who might lag behind their peers? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so we've been trying to do this personalization for a, a long time. And I think in the past when it wasn't quite the way that we wanted it, um, it's, it's made us reject it, right? So if a chatbot doesn't understand you, you're like, okay, well, this clearly doesn't work. And you can actually develop, you know, a negative response to it. So personalization has been difficult. Um, and I think in education, because education is so important, it's like medicine, it it feeds your soul, right? It's hugely important to to your journey on, on, on earth. Um, it's a sensitive topic and I think that, you know, the way we've chosen to approach it is by understanding sentiment and understanding different elements of the, the person behind the learner. And it actually is quite hard to fool the AI. Like if you, if you try and fool AI, it, it will pick up on things that just don't seem right and that, con you know, are contradicting to other answers that you may have given. So there I feel, okay, this journey with AI, this, this is on the right track for sure. Um, but like I said earlier, you know, what makes us human is what makes us human and makes us different than machines. So we still have to continue working on closing those gaps. And um, personalization is key. And I, I, over the next few months, even, we'll see massive changes because the systems are getting better. AI is getting exponentially better. So I would say that we're getting very, very close to building very strong personalized learning journeys based on many different uh, data points and features that we get from each learner. Great, thank you for that. All right, um, we unfortunately have to wrap up. So how about we do this? We are gonna follow up with you and get your presentation recorded so that all these people that have showed up to see your amazing thoughts can get those. Um, but will you leave us with a couple parting thoughts for people as they think about uh, education and the future in times of COVID-19? Yes, of course. So the, the start of my presentation had these beautiful pictures of elephants. And I, I chose elephants because in this time of unknowns, we tend to worry a lot, you know, and elephants are these incredible animals that show leadership through problem solving, through social intelligence, through openness, decisiveness, and patience. And sometimes I feel like we can let 
these moments teach us to learn from nature around us, to learn from other humans around us, and to learn from lessons that we actually already intuitively have within us. So give yourself some time, take a few deep breaths. Um, we are gonna come out of this stronger and hopefully better prepared for what's next. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us. Thanks for being flexible and patient. Um, and we will see you again soon. Wonderful. Thank you, Adam. All righty. See ya. Okay, everybody. Thank you as well for your flexibility today. We had a couple hiccups, but it seems to be moving smooth. Um, so we will see if that continues on with our next session. So we will, uh, we get to meet with Eric, Dr. Eric Rasmussen, um, who has been very, very actively involved. Uh, in responding to COVID-19 around the world. So this will be, we'll kind of dip back into what's happening with COVID-19 from somebody that's really been on the front lines. I'm gonna go get him set up and I will see you back here in probably 60 seconds or less. Thanks everybody.